Hi, welcome to the Morning Talk Show. Today is my conversation with Esther Lightcap Meek. Um, Esther is a philosopher and a teacher of philosophy. She is Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Geneva College. Um, and she holds a view of epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge, um, which uh, kind of stems from the work of Michael Polanyi um, and has been kind of alternately controversial and kind of ignored, but it seems extremely true to me. Um, Esther is such a warm and accessible person and has devoted her life to kind of um, communicating this view of epistemology, which is very real and also very, like, it, it, as much as it, this sounds like a negative in the modernist way of thinking, it's a very encouraging way to look at knowledge. Um, so in this conversation, she encourages me to read her book, um, A Little Manual for Knowing, which I have done since, and it is wonderful. Um, so we don't actually get to talk about that book, but I would recommend it, so I'm putting that in the intro. So anyway, without further ado, if you're interested in knowledge and what knowledge might be and, and uh, a view of knowledge that seems very human, um, then please watch this uh, interview with Esther Lightcap Meek. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Morning Talk Show. Today is a conversation with Liam Kavanaugh. Um, Liam is someone that I connected with actually over Twitter who has interesting tweets and interesting ideas um, that occasionally uh, seem to kind of line up with my own. Um, we were chatting on Twitter and he sent me a, a fascinating essay he wrote um, called The Equality Complex, which is information that stems from a book he wrote called The Collective collective wisdom in the West beyond the shadows of the enlightenment. I had to write that down so that I didn't get it wrong. Um, but Liam is the head of research at, um, a collective called life itself. Uh, I'll, I'll have links down below to this stuff. Um, they are kind of pragmatic utopians and I must admit, I've always flirted with utopianism or, or figuring out, you know, ways that it can be done healthily and life itself does seem to really be, um, a healthy way of uh, approaching utopia. So they do um, they do things like uh, having co-living spaces and and sort of intentional communities uh, that are built around um, cross disciplinary uh, lines. So economists and activists and, and artists and philosophers kind of um, working and talking together. People who may not even um, cross each other's paths otherwise uh, to kind of think through. Um, the, the problems that we're having, uh, the cognitive problems we're having in the West. So um, Liam's, a co Liam is a cognitive scientist and studies uh, economics as well. And, uh, and so it's, it's all with a focus on wisdom and trying to approach wisdom, which um, it's getting less and less controversial to say that wisdom is, is lacking uh, in Western society and increasingly just globally. Um, and so um, I loved talking to Liam. He's a fascinating guy. Um, I'm sure we will talk again. So without further ado, here's my interview with Liam Kavanaugh. <laughs> Liam Kavanaugh, welcome to Morning Talk Show. Great. Happy to be on, Aaron. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I um, just to kind of to to preface the conversation for people listening. Um, I, I, I have guests of, of all different, um, well, I, I've discovered guests in, in many different ways. Um, some of people I've read their books, other people I've just um, discovered and been interested in and reached out uh, kind of impulsively and they've said yes. And then this is, uh, this is the first time that uh, a relationship has sort of started to organically um, somewhat organically come through Twitter, um, just enjoying, you know, each other's, um, each other's tweets and, and, and online presence and thoughts. And then a conversation that came around, um, your, uh, your essay on equality and then, and, and here we are speaking. So it's a little bit different than, uh, than sometimes, but, uh, uh, it's also nice to just, um, get to know each other somewhat fresh based on these kind of initial uh, thoughts. So 
Um, when I started, and, I, and I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the show, but I, I always talk a little too much at the beginning. Right, yeah, um, and I've seen a couple. <laughs> okay, wait, wait one minute. Wait. Okay. But uh, the, the, the method to my madness in talking a little too much at the beginning is, is that uh, I, I, I like to um, establish uh, myself and the interest, and then usually the conversation flows from uh, from there without a, needing a bunch of questions, which I don't have a bunch of questions prepared anyway. But one of the things I thought was hilarious, I think I might have even laughed out loud, was that uh, I tweeted the other day something about utopia and uh, and utopia being something that's a complicated idea for me uh, and that I've had a, you know, a bit of a tortured relationship with it. Uh, and then I, I went to your uh life itself website and it was like we are spiritual utopians i can't remember exactly what it was but it was like practical utopian yeah it, or yeah practical uh, but then it also it also went on to kind of imply that you've implied there are spiritual uh you know uh resonances to uh utopian ideas and it was just kind of hilarious how in line with where my head is at that that was so you, you being kind of uh, uh, one of the pivotal people in the life itself organization, um, ha, what, what's I'm interested in your in, in your your journey towards where you are now. Like, uh, if that's not too broad of a question. No, no, it's a it's a great question. Um, so I mean, maybe to place us generally, uh, you know, we're we operate mainly in, in Europe. Uh, we're very closely allied to uh, the Emerge Network. Uh, if people know who that is, it's the meta modern movement. Uh, so Ian McGilka's publisher, Perspectiva, is uh, the, of the newest book is, is sort of a part of that. And there's a, a wider movement of people who essentially believe that something like a new enlightenment is necessary and, and kind of see that as maybe not likely to occur, but sort of something that we're on the cusp of because there, there's also a, a large civilizational crisis that probably a few of your, your viewers have noticed. Uh, <laughs> and, and that um, it's, there's kind of a, a need to evolve or implode, uh, you know, put it blunt. Uh, and, and so there's, there's a, a group of people that have, basically uh, come together, a, a lot of us having very similar ideas uh, who are working to make that happen in their own small way. Uh, and so my, my, my path to that is basically that I've always felt that humans were, well, there was something deeply the matter with our society, I guess I should say. And I grew up in the, in the 90s uh, and, you know, it was the kind of end of history era with my intellectual coming of age, my university years. And I felt, okay, people believe this, but I don't believe it. Uh, we're, we're standing at this, this point in history where people seem to think it's the end of history. I was quite sure that it wasn't. I felt that the human rash, belief in their own rationality at that time, it's humans. Now I, I understand it to be more of a Western thing. Uh, needed to be somehow undermined that people could understand how far from rational they, they were. Uh, then we might have a chance of really knowing ourselves who we are. The kind of a you know know thyself right. uh, imperative. And so I first studied economics. And then after I realized that you couldn't reform economics from within because it was ideological, uh, I got, I swung towards uh, psychology and I was a, a psych and undergraduate, uh, undergrad, you know, that was when I made as an undergraduate. And I decided, okay, I'm going to go back and study ideology. Uh, and so my graduate work was in mimicry and embodied cognition. Really, those are, Mimicry is kind of an in-group phenomenon, how we, we pick up our feelings, our, you, know, you could say our, our, our implicit knowledge, what a lot of people 
would call their you know their their soul way um mm. you know even academics who, who, would, who would use that term uh but from you know the process of my thesis that we see in other places. right Rennie gerard kind of yeah yeah um Nicholas Humphreys, another person who's more kind of contemporary. And, uh, there's a guy, Merlin Donald. Uh, okay. And, and, you know, there's, there's a whole, you know, the whole uh, mirror neuron milieu. There's a huge number of people who are who look at it, uh, that kind of. And, and Michael Polanyi as well. Carl that is, Michael Polanyi is, is, is one of the people top on my, uh, to delve into list. Uh, yeah. For that, for that reason, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not super well versed in all the kind of mimesis, um, stuff, but it always seems like a really good deep well, uh, there. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, it's, it's really, you know, Polanyi's contribution is kind of saying that, look, there's this, and this is what we feel, Chris. So we're both probably many of your, uh, viewers are McGilchrist fans and interested in that side of things. I hope um, so. Yeah. And, and you know, mimicry is a way in which we let it be implicit, right? You feel the other person in an implicit way. There's, there's sort of an online simulation of how the other person feels. And when we attend to or look at something at the same time, you and I is a conspecific you have an emotion. I, it tends to move to me. There's a reason why we like watching movies together, uh, despite the fact that he says it. They don't really interact, but somehow we're still yeah. intimately watching it together, right? And, right. And, and because we, we form feelings about things subtly together. Yeah. That's all of, of uh, society. Uh, and so that fascination uh, really got me into Ian's work as well. Uh, and I would say that it's really actually reading uh, Ian's book made me realize, okay, I'd had a thought in um, my first year of graduate school. I, I w- had been reading Bertrand Russell, and I'd taken Ramachandran's course of Vila um, Ramachandran on my committee, so, uh, professor of neuroscience in our, in our department at UCSD, and you know, he told us, look, the only people who don't believe that there's a distinction between uh, the left and right hemispheres are people who've never seen a patient who came in with a full hemispheric lesion. There's definitely something there. It's very hard to put a finger on. Um, and and I, as a first year student, had read Bertrand Russell's History of Western Philosophy uh, first year graduate student and said, God, you know, at the same time as taking Ramachandran's course, I said, God, this sounds just like the left hemisphere is trying to devour the right as I read this book, which <laughs> describes the heroic forward advance of, of analytical philosophy, sort of sidelining all mysticism. I said, this is, you know, somebody should write a book about this. So I, actually, it was three months before Ian published. I did a literature review oh, wow. thinking someone had. You know, must have written something like that. And then I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll write something like that eventually. And then I thought, ah, there's probably somebody who's been working on it for a decade already who's out there waiting to publish, you know, and I, I found out about it five years later. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then when I actually read it, it's like, wow, you know, he did such an incredible job. Oh, uh, so thorough. Yeah. And I said, there's nothing, you know, that I could. I couldn't imagine improving on it in any way. You know, I had kind of had a similar idea, but the execution of it was phenomenal. Yeah. And, and yet when I discussed discussed it with people, it didn't quite sink in. Right. And so the, the I realized the problem that he has with that book is that basically there's a there's a, a first half which kind of explains being here now, right? It's not a viral thesis, a, a, a viral thesis, and it's not you know, it's, it's fault. It's just this is the issue that we we have as a culture. A viral thesis is one that you can explain in one line, mm-hmm. and people understand what you're talking about 
Right. And th- then you spend the rest of the book explaining this provocative thesis. Right. That's kind of the modernist uh, uh, gold standard or the, uh, the, the, I don't know how to, yeah, like the left brain gold standard would be that it has to be, that the thesis has to be uh, simple to explain, I think, maybe. Yeah, exactly. And, and what he has is basically, he writes a first half of the book, which exp- essentially explains what, well, the, the right hemisphere is the hemisphere of, you know, if you would put it really cool being here now and then in the left hemisphere is the, is the hemisphere of of f- forming an, an image or memories of your now or statements about what being here now is like right so the, and the, mm. the, the how the how it feels and the what is here uh and which is extraordinarily difficult to explain and then he spends the second half of the book trying to defend the thesis but when you require a whole book to explain the the first part then you know you it, there's difficult and and the problem is there that you have to have like some some type of direct insight or um, personal understanding of, the, of this kind of right hemisphere's world or just thusness uh as yeah. opposed to aboutness uh, or else this whole argument doesn't doesn't make any sense, right? Right, and, and so you know our that's a long winded way of getting to what we do. It's really it's the rhetoric of the living. I would say you know what we're really interested in is an organization creating environments, and spaces, and conversations that uh, are respectful of the fact uh, that we need to have a kind of embodied introduction to our conditioning. We need a, we need to have a return to the living and a, mm. a kind of um, encounter with, with truth, which is, which is necessarily uh, partially practiced, right? Partially contemplation mm. uh, otherwise those arguments have remained abstract right yeah uh, i think uh with with mcgilchrist um one of the things that it is sort of confusing it to people is that uh it it kind of appeals to the left brain as a study of the brain and then the discussion, the deeper discussion, if, if, you know, you almost have to be brought to a place of an, uh, of feeling the need for that deeper discussion. Otherwise it's going to seem like going from the concrete into the abstract and just sort of like losing the plot almost. Uh, and, and I see, so I wonder if, if, uh, not that I'm saying your organization is, is really just to, bring people towards McGilchrist ideas, because obviously that's not the case. But I wonder if um, it sounds almost like through these practices and, and things like that and, and getting people to to be here, be present now and, and things that w- you're, you're almost helping people to um, to actually discover and feel some of their desi- own desires or discover and feel some of their own needs that have perhaps been uh, and. I'm honestly speaking uh, from my, from myself, because uh, the more ideologically possessed you are, uh, I feel like I uh, raised in, in a conservative Christian context, there were, there were like entire uh, needs and, and, and I don't know, like a connection to the world that I wasn't even aware I was significantly craving, which is dicey is dicey territory to get into but is that does that kind of cover something that is in your mandate like to to help people feel because like uh you know the 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 core of mcgilchrist's work for me and we can we don't have to talk about ian mcgilchrist the whole time but the core of his work for me was that my mind actually has uh two very distinct points of view and even just that one even just that that one revelation is is massively earth shattering and would actually take some some coaxing and um, 
yeah, some, some care to bring that out. Yeah. So, and the, I mean, the short answer is, is yes. Yeah. So I've, I've just written a book, I, a book myself, uh, which is actually the same publisher as uh, Perspective Press, uh, uh, which is kind of lays a, a, a lot of this out a bit, which is, uh, it's called uh, Collective Wisdom in the West Beyond the Shadows of the Enlightenment. And the basic idea is that, you know, we are heavily uh, ideological beings in the West and say that, okay, we're suffering as a culture. Um, and I'm a, I'm a Zen Buddhist. That's my background. It's not yeah. very religious. I'm a, it's a Thich Nhat Hanh. I'm a Thich Nhat Hanh Buddhist, so it means um, we don't really believe in reincarnation explicitly. You know, we don't. Uh, there's not, it's not a very uh, religious, but it's a very contemplative uh, branch and a very engaged. So we're interested in activism and things. Sure. Like that. Um, and so the point of that book is really, okay, we've, we've gotten into this state, uh, as Westerners where we have a lot of suffering from a Buddhist standpoint, which is the background I come from. If you were to look for sources of suffering, you oftentimes look for attachments and the things that we learned during the period of of our history called the Enlightenment are a great way to look, or a great place rather, to look for the sources of suffering, right? So rationality, I mean, and this is the thing, the, the shadow of rationality, things, some of the things you've been talking about uh, are the shadows I would say the Enlightenment. And the more we learn to be rational, uh, the less space there is for mysticism. Um, when you realize that there's something missing, then there tends to be a pushing away of rationality. So we're kind of caught in this, this dichotomy where the view of rationality is that, well, you can discover everything or learn everything you need to know through, you know, through reason, through science, through propositional knowledge. Yeah. Or, and that's the view and either accept it or reject it. Right. So, you know, Fundamentalist Christianity basically rejects it. New Ageism rejects it, rejects it. Mainline scientific culture accepts it. Um, the kind of a nuanced understanding of these two sides of existence, of balancing two intelligences, is not something that we particularly practice. And it, it can't really right. be practiced well in a society that's bought into rationality, to the, the, this who that holds that view or and either endorses it or rejects it, right? Right. If you're either in the place of endorsing, rejecting, like right. you, rationality. And both sides of that coin end up sounding very much like fundamentalists uh, to me based on that, uh, on that uh, binary choice. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I recently had a, had a debate, uh, it sounds stupid. I had a debate in some YouTube comments, um, which I try to avoid, but the, I, I really wanted to get at what this gentleman was talking about. And it, and he was on the rationality, um, you know, uh, mathematical philosophy kind of, uh, side of things. And, uh, I eventually told him, and I mean, it, I made no, no difference at all. in in his view, I, I just came off like a total lunatic to him, I'm sure. But I, I, I said, you know, this is fundamentalism. Like this sounds exactly like the biblical inerrancy that I was, have been taught, uh, you know, that like basically both sides are simply looking for the final authority, uh, are simply looking to install an authority that they can either wield or be immediately adjacent to. Um, and, and then, and, and from then on, it sounds very similar to me, which is interesting. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. So, I mean, there's all sorts of individual freedoms. Uh, so that, you know, there's secularity, individual freedom, and then actually, and most controversially, equality, are 
kind of things I would put as these enlightenment views, and all of them get to be essentially quasi-religious. You know, that is the secular religion of the West. It's very much the the you know the left-brained, if you'd like to use it, you know, we can dispense with uh, McGill Christianity, I guess, from this point forward for people who don't uh, <laughs> you know know his work, but. Um, right. You know yeah. that 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 um, I like that yeah. McGill Christianity. That's good. <laughs> we can we can you know what we can look at is essentially that's the enlightenment religion or the, the religion of the weird, right? So I, I'm sure you well some some people have heard that um, Western educated individualists or industrialized um, rich and democratic people are the weirdest people on earth. <laughs> um, this is, you know, psychology studies have shown this, uh, which basically that people in that demographic, i.e. the probably you, uh, for the most part, uh, view the world through a, a logical lens, an analytical lens, more so than any other culture. It's a very, very distinct uh, separation across all sorts of, of uh, you know, types of experiments. Uh, for example, the extent to which we try to solve moral conundrums by resorting to moral rules rather than intuitions for uh, the tendency to explain people's behaviors in terms of constant personality traits that are true of them in every context, stuff like that, right? Right, yeah. Uh, we do that all over the place, uh, and rationality, trying to find rules for the way things work, seeing individuals as separate uh, people as these kind of uh, independent units of humanity that have things called personality traits that explain their behaviors in all situations who are yeah. equal with each other. They, there's kind of a rule that, you know, we're, we're, we're on some line of value and we're all, all equal. Uh, and finally, secularity where, uh, you know, basically it's, it's the, the twin of, of rationality that, that we kind of don't need or it's a bit superfluous and a mystical element. People can have it, you know, of course, but yeah, it's a nice it's little necessary. it's a nice little comforting uh hobby or something. People always use that word comforting. Uh yeah. yeah. I, I I an image that popped into my head as you were describing um this like us Westerners and our rationality is that uh like uh, the the idea that a lot of people have is instead of being a pendulum where at one point we were, you know, kind of uh, radically connected to community and uh, geography and like uh, just sort of radically connected to nature in a way that we didn't have a clear sense of individual self, um, moved to this better state of this total individuality and total equality that we're supposedly experiencing now, but it, 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 you could make an argument for the fact that, you know, if you looked at the sort of what we would consider the most insane expressions of, of the collective mindset that's sort of ancient cultures would have where they might be sacrificing one particular person's life to, you know, to appease the gods and we think oh man that's totally insane but we we may have pendulum swung to an equivalent level of insanity on the other side on the like what you just described of being a uh, a massive collective of total individuals who have supreme equality and yet total uh separateness it it like you know there's nothing to say that that's not the same level of insanity again and that we you know we swung past the you, you know usable utilitarian uh the the functionalness of of individuality long ago yeah exactly so you know the the what remains is kind of this not, oh we have to so you, are you saying we have to do human sacrifice no of course yeah. not. you want to go back to that well no yeah yeah <laughs> exactly there's there's a 
gaping chasm in between those two extremes and yeah to navigate it as, as, as best we can same with rationality and say what i call uh techno solutionism or uh you know, techno fetishism right that we're going to solve all of our problems through blockchain through uh teslas or what have you yeah transhumanism yeah i mean it's not that it's not that if we know our if we know our ideology we can see and ask ourselves skills right i believe that elon musk is going to solve global warming because it's reasonable or do i believe it because there's kind of a, a religious license to believe in technology and it feels good in right in society. And yeah rather than arguing against or for um the use of rationality i just what i look to do in the book is really say look this is an kind of an addiction right there's something that it feels like to be certain and in control and it feels really good and we've gotten used to be able to get our hits you know that feeling really easily you know, our computers and exactly what we want, or the grocery store we've constructed this totally predictable kind of existence uh and that's addictive uh and and if you want to get out of that you know the work is really emotional it's nice to have the ideas right? but what what buddhism has to teach what can be extracted or, or taken away you can say extract it's a wrong word taken away from buddhism is that we kind of start out with teachings or ideas we kind of turn them into convictions or what we call direct insights Right, so moving from, oh, I need every day to be my last. I don't really agree with that. But, you know, do you actually see it? Right. You see that you're impermanent. Right? It's easy for everyone to agree that we're impermanent. But, you know, right now, are you aware that this could be your last moment on Earth? And, right. and it's the same thing with all this stuff. Like, it's easy. Oh, yeah, we're not really sure. Oh, we have reason. You know, it, it's 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 overrated, but the understanding, seeing it, the depth of our own conditioning around these things, what they do for us, and how much we like to be right, how much um, we like to believe that suddenly we're gonna, everything's going to click into place, there's going to be the correct answer. We, we can beat people with arguments. I mean, the the, the addiction feeling that around the corner <laughs> we're going to you know crush somebody on twitter and, and they're gonna kind of know that they've been crushed you know i yeah. i would submit as kind of a, a particular species of, of uh, addiction to that sure feeling, right yeah 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 it's uh you can see or i can see uh how uh to what you're describing with sort of the the buddhist uh mindset is is that your um the basis for your insights isn't a collection of uh axioms like they can be expressed like something like mortality you know this could be your last day they can be expressed as though they're they are um sort of tenets memorizable tenets but the but the reason for the contemplative path and the reason for all of the kind of the, the meditation and that kind of thing is to actually uh, start like at the basis, to have at the basis of your beliefs and actions, the feeling that this could be your last day. Like I can say we're all connected, we're all deeply connected and we need each other. Um, and there are many people, myself included, who have said that as a, that's a kind of an ideological statement, you know, um, to push forward some kind of political agenda. But when I start, if I have the grace to start from the actual feeling that we're connected, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's a completely different thing. And it's like, it is the it, rationality becomes useful then i think um because rationality 
is just one of the things that um, kind of arises from an actual sense, you know, like rather than, uh, I don't know, it's very, the, 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 um, the analogy I, I have thought of in my own life, this all just comes out of lots of wrestling and, and such, uh, is that uh, when I was uh, trying to live an ideological faith, not knowing that that's what I was doing, um, I felt that I was given the ceiling of a, of a great structure. Here's where you have to end up. Here's the top. Here's the height uh, of belief. And it doesn't kind of matter how you, I don't know how, how applicable this is, but um, it kind of doesn't matter how you get there. You just have to, you know, stand on suitcases and, and get yourself up to this place that we've already told you to be. Whereas it, you know, uh, as, as opposed to a, a sort of more plant-like analogy where you begin from, you know, you've been planted in a particular place, you've been watered by a particular uh, thing, and you kind of move forward out of a, out of an actual internalized sense of life. I don't know, I'm getting a little bit, uh, I'm getting a little bit religious here. Maybe you can take over and... <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's, well, that's, you know, that's direct insight versus, I mean, the, the former is kind of a, a will, right? It kind of a self-control almost is kind of a, a technology of self-control, which is, and, and this is, you know, actually a part of the book. I mean, I don't get quite into that, but that, that religion or these, these kinds of wisdom traditions that we have uh, can go in a lot of different directions. And part of where we, we've ended up is that, um, our wisdom traditions got to be quite that you can call a extrinsic motivation is one way of describing what you're talking about. It's almost you're living up to a standard. So the you know what's really kind of going on there is that society set up a standard of being Christ-like, saintly, uh, and then people are not really connecting oftentimes with. Uh, a better part of their nature, which might be capable of really taking joy in, in other people's joy, like right? Really seeing the, you know, what we call the the equality, you know, of of the equal sacredness of human beings, and seeing everybody else is not different than you, and that they are, they are, in fact, kind of are, uh, you know, that's where true saintly behavior, according to most tradition, comes from. Whether I mean, because Buddhist saintly behavior, just, uh, you know, enlightened behavior, you can say in Buddhism, it's not very different in most cases from Christian saintly behavior. Right. Um, convergence yeah. of agreement that, you know, Christ like yeah, right. love, Buddhist non self are hard to tease apart. They don't, there's not much distance between them. Yeah. Uh, Every Buddhist I've heard talk for any length of time, it sounds, first of all, it sounds, like uh Chris, like the best of christianity to me and then also they'll often just directly evoke the name of christ you know uh they'll just directly speak of christianity which is something i i've always felt a, a real kinship uh with uh with buddhism for that reason um it, it like yeah it, i i may be as much a buddhist as a christian uh in in some of my sort of uh, internal life. I don't, I, I'm, but I haven't studied it deep as deeply as you have, obviously. Well, I mean, it's good to do that, right? Because it is, is our, our background. So a lot of these ideas that we, we, we've come up with are sort of like, you know, look, Christianity at the time of Martin Luther was, was in a very sorry state. I get into that you know, in, in the book. A little bit, but one of the things that he was protesting against one of, one of the, 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 the points uh, on his thesis was just that uh, there, were, there had been an effort to limit the number of male sexual servants of cardinals to, I think it was 50, that was decided to be, you know, it was too, too strict of a limit on the number of sexual servants of cardinals could have. Um, and, and, uh, and, 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 and that, that was a reason why Protestantism needed to form 
and 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 a part of a reason why secularity has been so successful is that you know you have two messianic uh, branches of religion who disagree about what the creator wants, then oftentimes that's a highly explosive situation. And secularity is kind of this establishment of the middle ground. Mm. Uh, and where reason is is holds and, and we can kind of dwell on this 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 non religious, non mystical, rational area where we kind of take uh, the shared assumptions of these, you know, Christian traditions as kind of axioms and then create a sort of system, uh, a rational system. And you leave the, the mystical stuff to the outside. And, um, you know, in that way, our ideas of equality, you know, often equality before the eyes of God is one way of saying you know, what we really mean by equality. Uh, and the, the society of individuals comes a lot from, you know, it's very resonant with, with the idea that, um, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, but the idea that all humans are somehow equally worthy uh, in the eyes of God, it's, it's a kind of political corollary. Uh, uh, there's a guy, Larry C. Top, who's written actually about this, uh, but I, I go into it uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book a bit. Mm. Basically, we we ended up in that place uh, where um, we don't we are very awkward about Christianity, right? And this is part of the, the issue is that that it's kind of like well, you know, it's sort of the our basic spiritual background, but everybody's sort of ashamed of it. Nobody talks about it, uh, and it's not. It's not a navigable way of doing things. Sort of that in denial of your own culture's history. Whatever you want to do with it, you know, we can we can talk about it. But you know, you know, for you know, for all of our sakes, just open to discuss the, the fact that this this is part of our history, and right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that you're you're getting right to the heart of where I like that's the nucleus of the need that I would be perceiving. Uh, and, you know, not that I perceive society's need in this really, uh, you know, actionable way, but um, we are I mean, we have a lot of identity crises going on. And a big one is about the, the Western, you know, internalized Christianity. And so people listening to this discussion um, who might share a similar um, sense of need to do something about the, you know, cognitive crisis going on in, you know, just in, in a massive way, they'll be frustrated because on the one hand, we don't want to just trot out Christianity as the, as the way we don't want to, I mean, we've tried to define ourselves as secular, but secularity has obviously not for a bunch of reasons, you know, not, not all of which are secularity's fault. Um, that hasn't satisfied Christianity is making itself into, uh, you know, a hilarious parody, uh, in, in some circles. Um, the, the spirit, the, the idea of spirituality is something that I think is that, that, that there's like a, a deafening background roar of desire for, spirituality, but the spirituality that we want, you know, it's strongest if it's nested in a long ongoing tradition, but all the traditions are uh, compromised and um, spirituality is is equated with a belief in in a um, 
you know, a spiritual realm of spiritual entities that you kind of have to have, have a positive belief in at least some of them, you know, God or fairy sprites or angels and demons, or um, even, even the forces of astrology. Uh, uh, like, like, I guess I'm, I'm reincarnation, what, or reincarnation yeah. whatever yeah, it is. Sure. And, and, uh, and at, on the one hand, uh, you know, my mind says, okay, take all of those on board, use them all as ways of viewing reality. Like just, just this week, um, a podcast I was listening to really made me have a glimpse of the utility of thinking about reincarnation. I don't really, I wouldn't as ascribe a positive belief in reincarnation, but the way it was being phrased in this particular podcast, because I listen pretty widely, it was like, okay, you know, I could actually think about it this way. So then, so then you start to turn all religions into thought exercises as though my cognition is powerful enough to take on board an entire religion as a, you know, as a, uh, an object lesson or something or a, par a parable, you know, and so I guess I will distill this down into something that maybe you can respond to instead of my crazy rambling. Um, one of one of my life projects, which, you know, in a utopian way is, I would rather fail towards this project than than ignore it. And the project is to identify rather than create uh, identify a, a primordial human spirituality um, that <laughs> that is not a a religion. Like you know, it, it's sort of like spirituality would be the um, cognitive language that we would actually bring into any religion that we that we go towards. And as dicey as it sounds, it seems to me like perhaps we could I identify some spiritual. We we need to we need to to find a, a much simpler definition of spirituality. And they probably exist. There's probably a sentence somewhere that'll just blow my mind. But I mean, I guess we need to get an internalized sense of the spirit as being um almost the inverse of rationality whereas with rationality we we perhaps build up a stronger and stronger system on uh as we go and and, and we put on the its armor in a way and we build its structures um whereas spirituality would actually be the core of openness inside us uh somehow that is rather than building up it's just leaving open doors to for things to to come so rather rather than a a, a positive forceful movement towards a, a horizon it's it's like I guess I guess what I guess I'm thinking of of uh, instead of being a river that flows in a specific direction, you almost spirituality is reversing the flow of the river and seeing uh, the flow coming back up a delta, you know, of 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 forking um, channels. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, like, and it's and it's specifically not closing off any of those channels. It it doesn't mean. I mean, that's that 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 would have to work in 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 conjunction with rationality. But I, I wanted to. I want to. I, I I want to have a better understanding or a better um, way to describe spirituality. And probably that's part of the problem is that the word spirituality and the word spiritual is is so loaded that. I'm I'm trying to do something that's impossible, but a new word also is impossible. So I've said too much. Uh, but what's your what's your thought on that? Yeah, no, I, I it's totally coaching uh, for me, and uh, um, and I, I agree with you. There, there's a a dicey area here. So one word that might be helpful is is mystery. So when you look across wisdom traditions, it's an interfaith conversation, a very 
useful in this regard. Right? So one thing that comes across over this with mysteries is present in all the faiths. They may they disagree on the stories that they come away with after encounters with mystery, the myth, but the uh, importance of dwelling in mystery is important everywhere, uh, and especially in the contemplative branches of um, all of the wisdom tradition. So, so you know, there's oftentimes Buddhists get accused of exceptionalism. You know, I, I probably wouldn't be totally immune to that accusation, but I would say like the cloud of unknowing in, in you know, the Christian tradition, right? Unknowing is kind of what we're just talking about, right? Um, freedom from the known uh, is a phrase in Jiddu Krishnamurti, a philosopher um, who, who was influenced by these uh, uses as well. Uh, that there's something like mystery as well. It's just, it's, you know, mysticism is, is giving up knowledge. When you're sitting in meditation you're, and, and getting outside of your thoughts, uh, there, it is being outside of knowledge, leaving knowledge to aside for a moment. The more, the more that you, one, one sense is kind of present, is that the, your mind is, what, what's in your mind is really the open to perception. And so you are seeing what arises to pay attention to something like the breath. That there tends, there's a mystery to that. Mm -hmm. for one know. thing I would say, uh, for some reason, when your hands are on the your left side of your face like they are now, your audio cuts out a lot more. Um, so uh, I don't know, and I, I hate to interrupt you, but I just missed a few a few key words in what you just said. So it, I know you talk with your hands a lot. I don't want to tell you not to do that, but it seems like maybe it's making the audio cut out. Keep going though. Okay. Well, I, I love this. Uh, the so the. But I swear, what I was saying was that um, mystery is a core element of the book and most wisdom traditions, right. virtually all of them. That something like as basic as mindfulness meditation, following your breath, is, is a form of being outside of knowledge. Well, when you don't know anything, what, what, what does reality acquire? What type of sense does it acquire? Becomes mysterious, right? right? It's a it's a surrendering, a will willing surrender of knowledge, right? And it's almost like a tiny little return to being an infant, where you are viewing things without understanding and just almost like pure, as pure of an experience as you've as you've had. Yeah, you know, and and so that's direct embodied perception, right? Um, McGill Christ go back and say you're getting to your right hemisphere. There is a right hemispheric shift uh, in when people do mindfulness. Uh, extreme states of uh, presence might be even more so. Uh, but that that that's one thing that the, the, the traditions don't disagree on, right? It's the importance of that. So that's a very useful core and I, and I think I mean really that's what we mostly emphasize is is practices that that pay respect to the importance of mystery or a culture that pays attention to, to the importance of mystery and our alienation from it. So you know this kind of mysticism has the two words, one of which is kind of crazy ideas that people have. Uh, about the nature of reality. And another one is that there's a kind of knowledge that we have, which is non intellectual, that allows a different kind, right? But outside of the intellect, the, the surrender to, to mystery, a different kind of knowing is possible. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really widespread. Uh, and yeah, that I, I explicitly endorse. And, life itself endorses and so and we're very interested in environments that people can live in and function in uh that 
pay respect to that, you know, that, that, that cultural loss. Mm. Yeah, that, that's all really good. Uh, and it's, it's so true, I guess. Yeah, I guess, um, when I was talking earlier, it, it probably sounded like I wanted to create a new spirituality. I guess I, I guess I just want to, yeah, just dis- describe it kind of like what y- you're saying, which is that it's actually this, this rather that, that it's, it's kind of an agnostic thing. It's, it's simply um, getting outside of, of that sense of, of self and separateness or, um, or the intellect, like it's it's one of the things that's very difficult for Western people, because um, you know myself included, I, I I really like intellectual things sometimes, and even just you know uh, even just the veneer of intellectualness, and you can get kind of excited about things that seem intellectual. So it's difficult to uh, without a, a sort of uh, heartbrokenness or a sense of need or uh, even desperation uh without identifying that in ourselves it's hard to uh climb the tower of intellectualism to realize that that actually we need to get to kind of get outside of intellectualism right it's like you you are standing on a particular structure that you realize you have to dismantle and and it's like oh shit this is a pretty big you know, like you have that that gl- glimpse of it, and it's uh, of a of the the end of the road. Uh, oh wow, that's that sounds amazing. But then you think, man, we're, we're dismantling a lot as well. It's a painful, it's a painful road to go down. So yeah, I mean, it, I'm excited to dig in more to what life itself is doing because I I guess I I just know barely enough to know how massive the task is in a way um, and how personal, how personal it is and, and like how uh, someone, I mean, practices is a good thing and, and, and getting together with people is a good thing because um, you have to feel it. It has to begin from, it, it has to begin from a, a feeling that, that, uh, that something is wrong and that, that the enlightenment solutions aren't going to get us all the way there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, exactly. So the thing that we're, we're kind of concentrating on this year. Uh, so what we've, we've done uh, in the last four years is kind of develop first, meet each other, develop a network of people and then slowly uh, buy physical spaces where people can come and spend time. Uh, so there's a whole hub in Berlin where people live together. So it's kind of an intentional community and apartment block where people are slowly kind of moving into that's going to uh, develop into uh, sort of a residency program. People can come, spend time, uh, live in an environment where essentially they're both a like an intellectual, we're, we're really interested in the, the civilizational crisis, right? So also um, the climate, um, climate uh, situation, um, everything having to do really with the, the intellectual part of of the crisis, right? That okay, the, there is a lack of there is a dysfunction in politics. There is um, an inability to transition towards system think, systems thinking. And so we draw a lot of people from those milieus, but the really important thing for us is that they are together in a space where fundamentally there's kind of a presence and a, and a connection with mystery. So it's a chance to spend time with people who are interested in those same things, but where uh, the, the need for connection with mystery is respected by the culture. Uh, and then we have a practice hub in Bergerac, which is uh, the biggest city close to Plum Village, which is Thich Nhat Hanh's monastery. Um, oh, wow. It's set up its old uh, French villa where 
this next year we're doing, which you can get cheaply. So managed for a quarter million euros to get this 13 bedroom uh, place in Bergerac. And so cool. it's now a residency. People can come for, uh, to be part of, um, basically what we're, we're putting it up for is um, it's called the, the Meta Sangha. So there's various, Sangha is a, is a Buddhist practice group. So what we mean is just a group of, of, of people who are mindful of, of um, the need to approach life in a, in a, you could say, spiritual or contemplative way. I prefer contemplative uh, way. And the idea is to, for people to come for month-long spaces. We might like to increase that in the future so that they come together over a particular project, uh, such as group support for really just really um, being present with the situation of, of, of the climate crisis, right? So rather than rather than talk about what we need to do uh, group support, how do we how do we support each other in being present with just how precarious uh, life at this point in uh, human history is? Yeah, uh, you know, group group support because it's difficult. As an individual, it's nearly impossible. Yeah. We're going to do something about it. Be kind of, it's like a support group for being a citizen of the globe. This time. Yeah, it's so imp- it's so important. Yeah, because that that particular crisis, the the climate crisis, can also be one that feels very distant and uh, is difficult to sit in, you know, in while living, a, a, you know, a, a full and busy life. Yeah, exactly. So there is. There's a, a number of of, um, of projects that we have lined up. People come for a month, and, and uh, there'll be another one, which will probably engage with more of uh, social justice conversations. Um, so, how particularly we can we can navigate around or through the, that crisis where we know that there's uh, a lot of conditioning that needs to be addressed. Uh, we also know that there's a lot of, you know, an epidemic of moral superiority around it, which can be evasive of the problem and sometimes counterproductive. Divisive, yeah. Yeah, and, but at the same time, uh, it's easy to get defensive and avoid the whole conversation by focusing on, you know, the, you know, absurdities of the people and, and, and to really kind of miss the whole difficulty. I would say, you know, from my, my view, I just wrote an essay perspective, which is um, a kind of outtake of the book, an adaptation of a chapter of the book called The Equality Complex, which is basically saying that we've lost Okay, we've sort of replaced a, a connection with the sacredness of other people uh, with a fixation on equality and measurable things. And it's not that equality and measurable things is unimportant. It just isn't a substitute for connecting deeply with the profound importance of the individual to have a right. how you should be equal on income uh, and say you know that we should agree that people's talents and values are roughly equal uh and that there's a lot of um well and also that essentially our society has made the value of the individual equal to their accomplishments and, and once you've done that you've you've kind of given up the game that when you when you accept meritocracies, uh, supposition that kind of we, we have these this personal value which is our merits uh, that actually it's there's nothing wrong with pursuing and respecting that type of status, reifying it. That everything that strikes people as absurd in the social justice uh, conversation 
makes a lot of sense. Because, you know, uh, okay, well, if people are measured by their accomplishments, then it's enormously important that we sort of figure out what people's true merits are. Uh, and, and once people have accepted that their their true merits are their, their, their measure of their value as a human being, then they're going to get enormously invested in us about what their true merits are. So we have all of these arguments about who doesn't doesn't have opportunities, which are, you know, not in any case um, a waste of time because, you know, we should be worried about those things. But when they're literally the measure of a person's value as a human, uh, then they're all consuming. And, and, and um, yeah, this is kind of what we ended up. So we'll, we'll do a, a month about navigating that. Yeah, that's definitely something that uh, that really uh, n- needs to be discussed. And I enjoyed that uh, essay, and uh, actually thought <laughs> I thought the conversation would be more focused on that, but we uh, <laughs> we didn't get to the essay until near the end. But I've really enjoyed uh, this. Uh, that is to say, I I, I should be wrapping up soon. But um, to I I really like the sound of of what you're doing. It's probably it must be very difficult during a global pandemic when you're trying to get people into shared spaces and that kind of thing. Um, Another thing that kind of came to mind as you were talking about these residencies and things that you guys are, or you folks are doing is that uh, I, I yearn as a, as a family uh, man, (laughs) as a guy with uh, three little kids and a wife uh, to, um, to, to see that kind of thing eventually expanded out uh, to where families could do these kinds of things. Um, because uh, right now I'm, I, I notice, you know, a lot of the people doing a lot of really great work in the, in these fields are by necessity kind of, um, you know, indiv- I'm not saying that, that they're, they're not family people, but that usually, you know, if you're going to a month long uh, yeah. residency, it's, it's, you're either a single person or you're someone who uh, economically is able to structure your life that way somehow. Cause I would, you know, my first thought is, Oh man, I'd love to come to that. You know, that'd be great to spend a month doing something like that. Uh, And then I'm like, Oh, but you know, I literally have a family that I can't uh, you know? So anyway, that's uh, I, I think it, I, yours is the type of utopia utopian uh, uh, thinking that, that I can get behind, you know, uh, and so I'm hoping that your utopia spreads uh, and grows to the point that you know there could be even greater opportunities to kind of be together, um, and especially to be together in a space where where mystery is intentionally kept as a as a value, you know. And I'm sure each person in the collective values mystery to a a varying degree, right? Some people just inherently don't and other people, for other people, it's, it, it's huge, but, uh, it, it does sound to me like the work that you're doing is very positive and very human. And I, I really do hope that people, um, that this podcast or, or something I could do could contribute, uh, to the work. And, and I know we'll, we'll be in touch, um, more, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's all really exciting stuff. I like the way that, yeah, I like the way that you're framing things, and I'm excited to read your book that's coming out. Can you very clearly say the name of the book one more time? Because I think the audio cut out when you said it the first time. Uh, collective wisdom in the West beyond the shadows of enlightenment. Ah, collective wisdom in the West beyond the shadows of enlightenment. And I know you said that in a in a in a thread in, on Twitter with me too. And it, it's it's a great title. The shadows of the enlightenment is that's a that's a great shadows of enlightenment because I mean yeah all light creates shadows and uh, uh, yeah I, I love that um, so um, Liam thanks so much for being here do you have anything you'd like to kind of end with other than that people should buy your book and check out life itself what's the website again life itself dot us life itself dot us um any anything else you'd like that you wanted to get in here before the end well i think yeah i think it maybe it's important since we kind of discussed the the 
the, the word utopia. Uh, it's kind of part of our philosophy is really just like not to avoid anything. And yeah, utopia has gone long in the past. We all, we all know that. And, but part of the reason for that is what we just talked about today is, okay, well, people kind of made a perfect world with all sorts of rules. Okay, this is this is what it's going to look like. We, we have an incredible level of rational arrogance that, you know, the dangers of utopia are huge. When, But there's a different view, which is sort of like, well, look, you have to aspire towards something. And if we're saying, well, we're getting ambitious about what are the possibilities. A lot of us think you know, capitalism has seen better days, our governments, institutions have seen better days. What other mindset is there to take in response to that than a you know, pragmatic utopian mindset, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not to say that we're going to reach it. I mean, certainly right. our best principles figure out this is the right answer. It's going to yeah. change. It's dependent on, on on technology, whatever somebody invents tomorrow might change the shape of that. Our history determines, you know, what we are capable of pulling off our, our culture. Yeah, all of that is uh, relevant. So it's like we're not actually using our best knowledge of humanity uh, to simply organize it, to think about, well, what what's the the best thing, the best system, the best way of life possible to come up with. Um, and, you know, we're starting at a smaller scale, but, you know, at the same time, that that's just going to be an ongoing conversation in our yeah. culture. So well, what we're really looking to do is, is identify some first principles and with the book and, and the practices, it's really just get for your mind. When you get mm -hmm. outside these like core um, delusions or shadows of our culture, and you may be able to see clearly enough to at least get a few steps in the right directions. So that's right. The, the idea for now. So it's it's like utopia that doesn't come from structures and systems first, you know, like almost like the hilarious way of thinking of like utopia is about having all the buildings be cool and pointy and uh, the ways that people walk through the city are are planned just so, you know, and like that kind of hilarious utopia. But what you're describing is more of a utopia that flowers out of, uh, you know, uh, a, a healthy and growing sense of self, you know, almost like it flowers out of uh, being fully human and fully present and, uh, you know, with a, a sort of sense of the sacredness of other human beings. And yeah, I mean, y you're correct that uh, we can't avoid utopian ideals. Like even, even I was raised with a, this, you know, idea of streets of gold uh as being our our destination beyond this earth you know and and uh and it's a kind of utopia it's you know in itself you know in that it's it's just beyond the veil of the possible and and uh but it but it does motivate people to some degree and, and anyway I, i'm ranting a bit but my point is <laughs> my point is that i don't think anybody who <laughs> who's heard this conversation would accuse you of kind of the i mean maybe they would but of kind of the unhealthy sense of utopia it's not like okay we're gonna set up a system that we're gonna pursue at all costs and eliminate those who get in the way of this machine it's like no we are building a utopia out of these spirits and souls or or these uh, uh awakened uh human beings and 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 pulling people into it through a sense of shared and felt need and uh you know and, and intimacy with other human beings so yeah it sounds great to me <laughs> i'm in it's gonna say a process that starts small right you know there's kind of, exactly yeah yeah well liam thanks so much for uh for being on morning talk show um 
you know, uh, I, I'd love to talk to you again someday and see how, how things are going, especially after I've read your book. Um, so you don't have to agree or disagree to that now, but I'm just saying I'll, it'll That'd probably be great. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, yeah. Thanks so much. And, and, and I hope you have a great, uh, rest of your night. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. 